Good morning, Fellowship Church. I want to welcome you back. It's been good to see you all again. I'm going to open us in prayer, and we'll get into the worship. So, God, thank you so much uh, just for uh, bringing us all here together this morning. Thank you um, for this cold season that makes us hopefully appreciate summer a little bit more. Uh, I thank you that you're a God that is flexible and uh, encourages us to to um, roll with the punches, and I think we're going to see that throughout a lot of today's service. So I just ask for a sense of peace and your presence here today. Amen. Y'all can stand or sit or whatever works, whatever... Uh, whatever is your quick quickest connection to God. In the crashing in the pressing, you are making a new wine. In the soil I now surrender, you are breaking a new ground. So I yield to you and to your careful when I trust you, I don't need to understand. Make me your vessel. Make me an offering. Make me whatever you want me to be. I came here with nothing but all you have given me. Jesus, bring new wine out of me. In the crashing, in the pressing, you are making a new wine. In the soil light, now surrender, you are breaking a new ground. You are breaking new ground. Make me your vessel. Make me an offering. Make me whatever you want me to be. Bring new wine out of me. Jesus, bring new wine out of me. Jesus, bring new wine out of me. Where there is new wine, there is new power, there is new freedom. The kingdom is. Where there is new wine, there is new power, there is new freedom. The kingdom is here, and they tell my old flames to carry your new fire today. Make me your vessel. Make me an offering, make me whatever you want me to be. I came here with nothing, but all you have given me, 
My name is Pat. Uh, if you're visiting us today, this is a portion where I do announcements. Uh, we have a tradition here where I tell dad jokes, and some of you groan, some of you laugh. I know you all think I'm funny, so I just want you to play along with that. OK, wow. Uh, tough crowd. No, I mean, actually, today I have a riddle. Yeah. There's a word that starts with E and ends with E, and only has one letter in it. What is it? Nope. Nope, not the letter E. So starts with E, ends with E, only has one letter in it. Any more guesses? Anybody? Envelope. There you go. And that joke is for Kevin, who is our resident postman. <laughs> There's another joke there, but I don't know. Um, anyway, we have opportunities to meet throughout the week if you're interested in uh, getting some more time in the text. The first one is Monday, and it is Wise Women's Group, and that is at 11. And this week it is at Bonnie's house. So if you want to get there, talk to her, and she will get you the address. This week there's no tacos and prayer on Tuesday, but Man Club is back at the Palmazic House at 6.30. Um, then coming up, well, Sundays we have two opportunities. 9 o'clock in the morning before service, we have our aptly named 9 o'clock hour where we go through the day's text. And during this series we are doing on The Chosen, we also show an episode of The Chosen here at MyCon Cinemas at 6 o'clock. And we encourage you to show up a little bit early uh, and get something to eat and support the theater. And then uh, afterwards, there's also some questions. So I believe next up is we are having a time of prayer. And I'm going to invite down Brian to help lead that. Thank you, Pat. Um, first off, welcome back to the Plumasics as well. They are earlier than planned, which is awesome for all of us and probably a little bit of a bummer for you guys because it's cold here. We have two surgeries coming up this week. I know Bonnie has surgery tomorrow, I believe. Um, so I want, we definitely want to lift up Bonnie in prayer there. And then also, um, Kiara, I'm not sure how much you would like to share, not share, um, what? Whatever. <laughs> Um, she, she learned she has a cyst the size of a basketball, um, which all of us have been trying to figure out how, where that fits. But yes, <laughs> so, um, and so sh this will be um, our last week with Kiara leading music <laughs> for about eight weeks-ish maybe. Yeah, two months. So definitely be keeping her in your prayers um, daily and even hourly, I guess, whenever being in prayer and song all day long. Um, but I'll, yeah, I'll lift both of them up and please if anybody else as well. Lord, we thank you so much for today. And um, first, we want to lift up Bonnie's surgery tomorrow. And um, and actually, uh, all together, Lord, I'm just I'm praying for wisdom and guidance for the doctors. Uh, we praise you for... Um, what was found in Kiara, and um, early enough with just mild discomfort, and they, all the doctors are very hopeful. And Lord, I pray that not only with that surgery, but as um, it is completed, that nothing but um, more hope and smoother sailing from there. I pray for our community uh, over the eight weeks that aroundish that she will be gone, and. Hope she feels blessed um, for blessing us all these other times. It has been a true blessing. 
We lift up the rest of the service to you. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. All right. Thank you. I love you all. Bonnie. Hello, hello, hello. Hey, we're back. Cool. No idea what changed. <laughs> You're welcome, Aubrey. But you'll have to thank your dad. Yo, you guys are here. <coughs> All right, folks. We're going we're gonna to go back into the, the worship bit because, like, the person that we're talking to when we pray is here. Evelyn. Dawson. Hi, guys. you, Lord, for your mercy never fails me, and all my days I've been held in your hands. From the moment that I wake up till I lay my head, I will sing of the goodness of God. I will 
Good morning. Uh, when we knew that um, Perry was going to be gone, several months ago probably, we some of us had an opportunity to like say, hey, I'd like to fill in, and I didn't. Okay, I was like, I'm super busy, I've got a lot going on, and as much as I can enjoy speaking, it takes a lot of time and effort. I'm like, no, I'm not going to do it. And here I am. <laughs> 
Um, if you've heard me before, you know, I really like a uh, time to really like think about the scripture and imagine it and like look at it in the text and all that kind of stuff. And I had like three days this time. So I had an epiphany this morning after I had the message written. And so I'm super excited. It's, um, I just want to thank God um, that sometimes we make our plan and then God directs our steps. And so um, I did actually have something that I feel like God wants me to share with you today. So if you would pray with me. Father God, thank you so much for your goodness. Hmm. Thank you that your goodness is chasing after us. It's all around us. And we invite you, God, it can be in us too. God, thank you for this an amazing story about how you kicked off your ministry and how from the very beginning you knew that you were going to redeem the world. God, be with me today as I share this message. And if anything I say is from your spirit, please let people remember it. And if it's just me, let them just forget. In Jesus' name, amen. John is a brilliant writer. If you read, you, you might, if you're familiar with the Gospels at all, you know that there are three, um, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and they have a very similar feel, very narrative, and different focus, but they're very similar in their pr um, presentation. But John is completely different. John's Gospel was written last, and it was almost like John was like, okay, so we have these three accounts, and they do a really good job of talking about the life of Jesus, but I have some gaps I need to fill in, some things about Jesus that I know as one of his best friends that these Gospels don't include. And so he starts out with this epic picture in the beginning. And the, John 1 is probably one of my favorite poems in the Bible. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning, and through him all things were made, and nothing was made that has been made. In him was light, and that light was the light of men. I love it. I love it. John starts with this huge picture of the Word of God being made human. He is Emmanuel. He is God among us. The divine has come to dwell with his people. The second half of the first chapter of John talks about um, Jesus' baptism. And then the last part of that is when Jesus called his first disciples. So in that part, he has James and John, Andrew and Peter. And then the, then the next day, he calls Nathaniel and Philip. And the day after that, they all go to a wedding. So in that first chapter of John, we have... The half, first half of it is Jesus as divine. And then the second half of it starts showing us that Jesus is also human. He gets baptized. He has followers. And in the beginning of chapter 2, he's going to go to a wedding. You can um, show the picture, slide 2. So uh, it's difficult, at least for me, to sometimes hold Jesus as the word of God and a person like me. And... Um, it's really, when we went to go see The Chosen last Sunday, I told Mark that this one is like one of my very favorite episodes in the whole series, and this is one of my favorite clips. Um, and this actually is at the end of the story, but we're going to watch the clip of Peter and Jesus. What will be next? Any suggestions? Anything and everything. Let's do this. I'll go with you to the ends of the earth. I hope so, Simon. But I seem to remember there was a problem. Something about Andrew's feet. Andrew's feet! But first we must evaluate, no? No, uh, no, 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 I can't. I think we have to. No, 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 I can't. <laughs>
going to do? <laughs> I love that. Some things even Jesus can't do. I love that clip because it shows a side of Jesus that I don't often think about. The side of Jesus who dances at weddings, who drinks wine, and who jokes around with his friends. That's what Jesus was like. I think that's one of my favorite things about this whole series is it helps us give Jesus a three-dimensional feel. He was a man like us. He sneezed, you know, like he... he you know, he, he made fun, like he teased people, like he was full of joy. And I love how serious Peter is at the beginning of that. I'll follow you to the ends of the world. world. And then, it, you know, sometimes in our two-dimensional Jesus, then Jesus is like, well, then follow me. You know, and it's all like this solemn, uh-uh. Jesus takes that exact moment to tell a joke. Well, yeah, but I think we have a problem, you know, Andrew's feet. Our story today begins in John chapter 2. So we'll read through that section. Um, this is from the and, um, New Living. The next day, there was a wedding celebration in the village of Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples were also invited to the celebration. The wine supply ran out during the festivities, so Jesus' mother told him, they have no wine. Dear woman, this is not our problem, Jesus replied. My time has not come. But his mother told the servants, do whatever he says, or do whatever he tells you. Standing nearby were six stone water jars used for Jewish ceremonial washing. Each of them could hold 20 to 30 gallons. Jesus told the servants, fill the jars with water. And when the jars were filled, he said, now dip some out and take it to the master of the ceremonies. So the servants followed his instructions. When the master of the ceremonies tasted the wine, that, or the water that was now wine, not knowing where it had come from, though of course the servants knew, he called the bridegroom over. A host always serves the best wine first, he said. Then, when everyone has had a lot to drink, he brings out the less expensive wine. But you have kept the best until now. This miraculous sign in Cana in Galilee was the first time Jesus revealed his glory, and the disciples believed him. In this translation, it says the next day. But in several other translations, it says, on the third day. <clears throat> and I was interested by, like, there's a couple different ideas of what that third day meant. Um, traditionally, Jewish weddings were held on the third day of the week. So Saturday was the first day, Sunday, I don't know. Anyway, the third day was the day that they held weddings on. But it was also... Um, I forgot what the other way it was. Anyway, that was, it was the, whatever the third day was. But John um, writes this because he is writing to people who already know the story of Jesus. So when we hear on the third day, what's the first thing that we think of? The resurrection, right? And that is exactly what John wants you to think. He wants you to remember the resurrection, because honestly, there are so many things in this story that point to Jesus' resurrection from the very beginning. So if you have the handout, I was talking to a couple people beforehand. My background is in education. I'm a teacher, so I like to have, you know, little things for you to do. So in your handout, the very first one says, on the third day. So they're having this wedding, and it's on the third day. Oh, I know. The other part was some people say it was the third day of the wedding. Like, it was a week-long festival, so it was the third day of the wedding or it was the third day of the week. It doesn't matter. The third day was meant to remind us that it was this, the third day was the day of the resurrection. And so Mary notices they're out of wine, and she says to Jesus, she's not asking him anything. She simply says, Jesus, they're out of wine. And then I looked at this in several different translations, this was the one I liked best. It says, dear woman, that's not our problem. My time has not yet come. And then I hear that, and it sounds like Jesus is saying, no, I'm not going to do anything. But what Mary hears is, yes, I'm going to do something, because the next thing she does is tell the servants to do whatever he says. So what did Mary understand from that interaction? That I don't. Well, the first thing could be the nuances in the first phrase he says is, that's not our problem. 
Another way you could look at that was, that's not a problem. So um, one of the guys I listened to who I thought did a, think did a fantastic job on this text is Brian Zahn, and you can find his video of Water Into Wine. Um, I consider just showing his message because it's really good, but he makes the point in there that if um, something similar to like, if Mark and I went to the movies and I noticed that there's a couple of teenagers there who didn't have enough money to pay for their, their movie ticket, I would say, oh honey, those kids don't have enough money for their ticket. And he'd be like, that's not a problem. I'll just slide them you know, a couple dollars and then they'll be able to pay for the ticket and get in. It's not a problem. So it's possible that that's what Jesus was saying. This isn't a problem. The second thing he says is, my time has not come. And like I said, normally when I'm speaking, I like to think about the scriptures and like, you know, ponder them for a while. Well, I had finished this yesterday. I did not stay up late, so I went to bed. And this morning, I was getting things ready and I was thinking about that time. My time has not come, my hour has not come, and I'm like, where else in the Bible does it say my hour has not yet come? What does it mean? Like, what hour is Jesus talking about? Because I was always told that that hour was the hour for his public ministry to start. But, and I was like, well, what does, so I was like, huh, I wonder if that's, so I looked. I was, this was like the most excited I've been for a long time. Um, I looked up where John specifically, and maybe, I don't even know, if, there's four times in the Gospel of John that he uses the phrase, his hour, either he says, my hour has, two times he says, my hour has not come, and two times he says, my hour has come. So the first one we read already, right? He says to his mother, my hour has not yet come. John eight twenty, he spoke these words while teaching in the temple courts near the place where the offerings were put in, yet no one seized him because his hour had not yet come. John 12, 23, but Jesus replied, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified, and Jesus is predicting his death. And lastly, in John 17, 1, after saying all these things, Jesus looked up to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son so that he can give glory back to you. So if four times in the same book, that phrase is used, I would say that Jesus is not talking about the hour of his ministry to start. He was saying, Mary, I can help because my hour has, is, isn't, hasn't come yet. The hour when I can't do miracles anymore. The hour when my ministry is over. It hasn't come yet. I've got time. I have time. We can help this happy couple because the end isn't here yet. And what that tells me is that from the very beginning, Jesus was thinking about the end. Oh, Lord. I really didn't want to cry when I did this, but this is just so powerful to me. So Jesus looks around, and, I, and it's, it is completely intentional that he found those jars for ceremonial washing. There was a tradition that was developed where before any time a person came in contact with bodily fluids, they had to wash. Before they could go into the temple, they had to wash. Like there was just this ceremonial ritual washing. And so there's these big jars that would use to be filled something called the mikvah. And the mikvah was like a, you know, it was like a cow trough. <laughs> big enough to submerge your body in and wash. So there are these six huge jars that were used for the ceremonial washing. And the rules around these were so nitpicky. The water had to come from a certain source. If there was any water, there had to be a certain amount in there. If any of it was out, there's only a certain limited amount of like tap water you could add to it. Like it was just ridiculous how specific these things, um, these things were. So are we on slide five? Okay, These are, this is the picture of them looking at those um, jars. So Jesus makes wine in the mikvah containers. And another thing that John does, you know, all the other gospels share lots of miracles that Jesus does, but John only tells about seven. 
And he doesn't call them miracles. He calls them signs. And this is the first sign that Jesus turns water into wine. And what was the sign that Jesus was trying to make? This is a huge shift in how we are going to understand our relationship with God. Instead of always washing and washing and washing and never, ever being clean, God is going to make is going to invite us to a table where it's more like eating and drinking with friends, with nothing to prove because you know you belong. Temple worship was all about who was in and who was out. But Jesus was going to change the rules in the way we related to God, and there was going to be no more in and out. It was going to be an invitation to all to come to the table. It wasn't going to be about rituals anymore was going to be about relationship. Perfect. <clears throat> Slide seven says that Jesus made a lot of wine. A lot. I, I didn't do this math. I let someone else do it. Um, but... It is said that each ceremonial jug would hold approximately 100 to 150 bottles of wine. So if Jesus told the water turned so Jesus turned the water into a total of 600 to 900 bottles of wine. And if everyone like they took the average attendance to a wedding at that time, if everyone drank 3 glasses of water each, which is based on the average size of a bottle of wine, that was enough for 1200 to 1600 people. But the average attendance for a Jewish wedding at the time was about 200. So Jesus made six to eight times more wine than was necessary. In the Old Testament, the abundance of wine was a symbol of God's favor. But the scarcity of wine and the destruction of vineyards was the absence of God. There are verses in the Old Testament that said that the, when, when the presence of God is there, the vats will overflow with wine. The mountains will drip with sweet wine and that God would make a feast of rich food and wine. But during the time of the exile and during the time of the Roman um, occupation, there wasn't enough wine. But Jesus was saying God's presence is here. There's more than enough wine. He was saying that as opposed to doing this, all this effort to come close to God through ceremonial washing, there wasn't only wine for you to, to drink, but there was more than enough for everyone. So they went from having no wine to having a lot of wine, but was it any good? Let's take a look and see what kind of wine Jesus makes. Video one. The latter vintage, sir. Good, good. Let's have a taste. Stop the music! Stop the music! Everyone, listen! I have something I would like to say. I would like to address the bridegroom and the bride families. At every wedding I've ever overseen, they serve the best wine first. And then, when the people have drunk freely, much later in the feast, they serve the poorer wine, the cheap stuff. <laughs> because by then, who is going to notice? <laughs> Am I right? But you, you have chosen now to serve the best wine I have ever tasted. Let us thank them for this unnecessary but honorable gesture. But you have now, you have saved the best wine for now. The best wine I have ever tasted. So if you're following along, that's number four. You have saved the best for last. There's so many things. I, I, uh, I recommended a couple songs um, to Kiara, 
but not all of them. And uh, one of the songs that she chose was the song about how we are Jesus' bride and he's the bridegroom. When Jesus serves the wine at his wedding, it's the best wine. It's more than enough for everyone. As I was going through and thinking about this story and thinking about Jesus' first miracle of being water into wine, and then I was thinking about the significance of wine, and I was thinking about, oh, yeah, <clears throat> the Last Supper. Jesus does this thing with the wine where he says, this wine is a new covenant, a new promise with you. And I was like, when is Communion Sunday anyway? It's today. Today we're remembering the new covenant and the new promises that Jesus gave us, new promises and better promises. It says in Hebrews 6, 8, 6, but now Jesus, our high priest, has been given a ministry that is far superior to the old priesthood. For he's the one who mediates for us a far better covenant with God based on better promises. The end of this section that we read, the last verse, says that this miraculous sign in Cana was the first time that Jesus revealed his glory. So as much as this was a great thing for the couple, and as much as it was a, you know, a thing, fun time for the wedding guests, this was Jesus' intentional display of his glory. He wanted to show his disciples who he was and hoped that they would understand why he had come. He had come to break the old system that kept people far from God. He came to open the way so that we could all come. And he would say, whoever so will, come. Come to my table. Come from wherever you are. Come as a woman, as a man, as a minority, as the person in power, as a person in poverty. Come to my table. Come to my table. From the beginning, Jesus made enough wine, more than enough wine for everybody. And when his hour came, his blood was more than enough to make us clean. Not from ceremonial continuous washing that would never make us truly clean. And the, but his one-time sacrifice for all, Jesus is inviting us to come to the table. So I think we will sing... Um, our closing song and if during that song do we have the bread yet okay um, if any time during that song we can pass out communion um, we'll take our communion when uh, when the song ends go ahead All right, humans, would you like to stand or sit or dance or wave your arms around or whatever is conducive to your worship experience? All right. This is where grace begins. We were hungry, we were thirsty, with nothing left to give. All the shape that we were in. And just when our hope seemed lost, love opened the door. Sit down and be set free. Come.
the thief and to the doubter, to the hero and the coward, to the prisoner and the soldier, to the young and to the older, all who hunger, all who thirst, all the last and all the first, all the paupers and the princes, all who fail, you've been forgiven, all who dream and all who suffer. in surprising ways uh, by evidence of both uh, <laughs> Peggy and I standing up here for communion. We didn't plan this. We didn't have time to talk. Uh, but this is the text or the liturgy I found for our time of communion. So this is an invitation. Christ our Lord invites us to his table. All of those who love him who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. You are welcome. Let us remember on the night he was to give himself up for us. He took bread and gave thanks for it. He broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then, when supper was over, he took the cup and gave thanks. He gave it to his disciples and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood, the blood of the new covenant, and it is poured out for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. And so, in remembrance of these mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us. Go out in peace, love, and serve the Lord. 